do fire, electricity and the internet have in common? None of them will have as profound an impact on humanity as artificial intelligence will have. At least that's the view of Sundar Pichai, the CEO of Alphabet. And why should we take his view seriously? Because Alphabet, like most tech giants, is pouring vast sums of investment into AI and they fully intend to change our lives for good with it. That's why I'm at the World AI Can Festival, to meet some of the people who are driving this change, which is already affecting every sector from healthcare to education, manufacturing to communications. What are the benefits and what are the risks? Let's start with Microsoft. Enric Lopez, you are the Director of Artist Artificial Intelligence at Microsoft France. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. So for those of us that still see AI as futuristic or distant in some way, can you just give us a couple of examples of how it's already affecting our daily lives already? Yeah, I'm sure that uh, uh, everyone has experienced the personal assistant that they have in their phone or application or having face recognition and all that stuff. But in your work life, for example, you might uh, don't know that you already have AI in Outlook for you know, the priority inbox and the non-priority uh, inbox, or you see so recommendation and suggestion in Teams in, in order to answer. So those are some scenarios that you already have. And for example, you might not know, but you can do some automated translation within PowerPoint. A few years ago, back in 2016, Microsoft came out with its own internet chatbot, which was like many others at the time, but it had this huge issue because people started asking questions uh, and it was responding to them with racist genocidal answers and you know you had to pull it from the market very very quickly so what have you learned from this experience and how do you now approach this issue of bias yeah that's that's a competing moment where uh, that, where we we learned a lot and and uh, things there and it's, it's been you know uh, more than five years that, that we have grown it our responsible AI into also three, you know, uh, uh, pillars. One is principle, having six principles guiding our, uh, our uh, activities on responsible AI. For example, fairness, transparency, responsibility, and also uh, putting that, th those principles into practice, into governance, internally with an ethics committee reporting to Satya Nadella, providing, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, some guidance, uh, helping, you know, engineering to uh, find if there is bias in our, in our uh, AI, but also, uh, you know, um, uh, refusing to answer to RFP if AI will be used for, for customer or will be used in some, uh, you know, uh, condition that are not respectful to our principle. And the last one is building tools and providing that tools and open source to help others to build the responsible AI. Eric Lopez, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. AI's most talked about talent at the moment is natural language processing. In particular, programs where you put a phrase in and an image comes out, based on everything the AI has learned from looking at thousands and thousands of other images. Just last week, there was yet another breakthrough. The San Francisco startup OpenAI released DAL-E2, its latest image generator, and it's got extraordinarily creative and imaginative. Just look at what it responded to the phrase a Shiba Inu dog wearing a beret and a black turtleneck. This was its response to teddy bears mixing sparkling chemicals as mad scientists. And this is what it had for a bowl of soup that looks like a monster knitted out of wool. And while this is a lot of fun, some people are increasingly worried, not least because tools like this tend to replicate and even amplify human biases. And because while AI at the moment is very good at doing a specific task within a limited scope, lots of researchers are looking into making it do lots of things at once, a little bit like a human brain does. This, of course, raises lots of ethical questions and fears that we might end up creating a super intelligence that doesn't necessarily have our desires and our interests at heart. These sorts of concerns are exactly where organizations like the Responsible AI Institute comes in. And I'm joined by Dr. Manoj Saxena, who is the director and chairman of the Responsible AI Institute. And he's also a professor of ethical AI design at the University of Texas. Thanks for joining me. You're welcome, and thank you for the opportunity. So you're doing some really interesting work creating the world's first certification program for AI projects. Can you explain a bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so AI is one of those incredibly important and exponential technologies that has the potential to learn on its own. And as it starts learning from new data and it starts creating new observations and new predictions, there is a tremendous amount of opportunities for improving experience as well as creating 
massive harm. Uh, and, and one of the reasons uh, we started the Responsible AI Institute five years ago as a nonprofit was to focus on building systems that are human-centric, that are trustworthy and explainable. Because what people don't know is 99% of AI systems operate as black boxes. And most of the AI systems, the data quality is not managed. So there is a massive amount of possibilities for unintended harm that AI could cause. So our certification program is going to be a seal of trust that says that the AI has been designed in an explainable, transparent, and regulatory compliant fashion. As you mentioned, you were the first uh, general manager of IBM Watson. Now, a decade ago when you were in charge, this was one of the hottest AI systems in the world. And now I believe it's mostly used for medical research purposes. Can you sort of explain why that might have been? Yeah, absolutely. So Watson was one of those seminal moments in the AI industry that brought massive awareness and massive focus on the potential of AI. And IBM has a track record of doing this before. I mean, the mainframe computer, when it came out, it changed the world, and IBM was able to use the technology for human good. And 10 years ago, when we brought Watson and put it to work, we focused on healthcare, we focused on cancer. So it's doing quite well there. We continue to solve important problems, and IBM continues to invest in that. And in fact, um, AI and cloud are the two major components of IBM's strategy and uh, for, for driving growth. Where Watson is today is it's an important subsystem for an entire new class of systems that have come up now. So you have self-driving cars, you have self-flying drones, you have you know, medical imaging, you've got banking and dating and everything else. So Watson is a part of the AI ecosystem now because the industry is a multi-trillion dollar industry. And uh, from what I understand, IBM continues to invest quite a bit in it. Manoj Saxena, thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Thank you. So all the hype surrounding IBM Watson faded, but it remains a useful tool to this day. So maybe some of big tech's big ideas about creating an all-encompassing AI that governs every aspect of our lives won't come to pass, and we'll just be left with things like robot call centers, machine-generated art, and automatic email replies. But remember, in 1920, electricity wasn't something that most people thought they needed.